three Jewish MPs were in the BBL, and of the 12 Jewish MPs in Westminster in 1905, four voted for the Aliens Act, four abstained and four voted against. At that time, Jewish opinion could be found across the political spectrum, from what might be termed the far right to the far left. We've actually done some original research into the British Brothers League, particularly the meetings they had in the People's Palace. Here's the advert in the local paper at the time, the East London Observer, from the 4th of January 1902. It's for the first big meeting the British Brothers League had at the People's Palace in Mile End. Uh, the chair was taken by M Major Evans Gordon, and interestingly enough, it says that the meeting was drawn to was called to draw the government's attention to overcrowding, excessive rents, and the undercutting of wages of the workers of East London. Something's never changed there. And further down on the same page, this is totally unrelated to the British Brothers League, but it's interesting that there was a uh, a concert held in Wapping by all the uh, showbiz people from London at the time, performing for free for the relief of the local, the, the indigenous poor. It's a bit like an early version of Band-Aid, but uh, with all the, all the proceeds going to home-based charities rather than the rest of the world. This is interesting because in the same issue of the East London Observer, it mentions that Will Crooks, the uh, Labour dockers leader that we've already looked at, sent a letter of support for this first British Brothers League thing. It just shows that it was a united thing between Labour and the Conservative people all supported the British Brothers League, particularly patriotic Labour people like Will Crooks. This is the uh, report in the newspaper following the meeting. Anti-alien crusade. Unfortunately, you can't. The, the header of the newspaper is shining through there from the previous page, but... Uh, they didn't have big headlines on their, on this newspaper, but that is a big headline for the uh, for this newspaper at that time. Great meeting in East London, legislation demanded, enthusiastic proceedings, and there was columns and columns of a virtually verbatim report of what happened in that meeting. It's very interesting. This is uh, the advert in the same newspaper in 1903, November 1903, for the second of the big demonstrations in the People's Palace by the British Brothers League. Lastly, this is the report for that second meeting. Alien demonstration, again the small headline you notice, this was the main headline in the newspaper. Alien demonstration, monster gathering at the People's Palace with this strange spelling of the word monster. Uh, I, can't, I don't know why, R-E, the other way around. It says the same spelling of the word later in the article. And then there was a vote of thanks to Major Evans Gordon at this particular meeting as well. Queen Mary College also has an important place in my personal connection with the East End. When I went to university I chose to go to QMC as it was in the East End, the place that I regarded as the heartland of British nationalism, and I ended up living in the East End for many years thereafter. We are now further down the Marlin Road towards the city at Marlin Gate. From this crossroads we can see the Blind Beggar pub where the Crays, a local gangster family, murdered George Cornell in the 1960s. Just down the road from the Blind Beggar is Whitechapel Chew. Behind the present day tube station the body of Jack the Ripper's first victim was found. I won't be showing you a picture of the body but here's a picture of the grave of one of his other victims, Lizzie Stride. It's the only one that didn't get a proper gravestone at the time. The marker was only recently added. I hope that's got rid of the normal gory tourist attractions. Back up Marlin Road, we have Marlin Waste. This is where William Booth held his first meeting in 1865, which led to the formation of the Salvation Army. Back around to the south of Marlin Gate lies Sydney Street. There was a famous siege here in 1911. An armed gang of Eastern European anarchists that were also asylum seekers committed a robbery and shot down five unarmed policemen in Houndsditch nearby and they were traced to Sydney Street. As the police weren't armed, troops had to be called out from the Tower of London. Winston Churchill was Home Secretary at the time and he personally came down to have a look, have a look at what was going on. The asylum seeker gang were all killed when their house was, that they were holed up in was burnt down. We used to use Mile End Gate as a redirection point in the early 1980s for meetings. 
that was when I first got involved with Tower Hamlets. At that time, there was also a, a so-called vigilante group that called itself the East London Workers Against Racism. Their initials are LWAR, E-L-W-A-R, and all they actually did was go around a couple of nights and daub do up graffiti in the area, which people changed by crossing off the E-L at the beginning and adding a T at the end so it said wart. Some of this graffiti can still just about be seen on the wall here. That's enough counter graffiti talk. Next we'll have a look at other interesting historical sites in the East End. The early 20th century asylum seekers soon got involved in political agitation in London. This is Jubilee Street in Stepney, the site of a famous anarchist club that opened in 1906. While in exile in London, Lenin, the murderous leader of the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia, used to attend the club. Even though the club was used by foreign troublemakers, this is still an important historical site, but is now obliterated and replaced by an anonymous row of modern terraced housing. On the uh, right here is a DOS house, it used to be a DOS house that Stalin actually stayed in, this one here. Over there is the, on the right hand side there's the uh, London Hospital, that's where the Elephant Man skeleton is supposed to be, uh, supposed to be kept in there. This is the Cable Street Mural which was painted by a left-wing artist to commemorate the so-called Battle of Cable Street in 1936. This was when Sir Oswald Mosley's party, the BUF, attempted to march through the East End, starting at Tower Hill, by that part of London Wall we saw earlier. Various opposition groups mobilised to stop Mosley, not so much at this location, but more down the other end of Cable Street, near a place called Gardner's Corner. These demonstrators fought with the police and Mosley agreed to call off the march. The left heralded this as a great victory, despite the fact that Mosley subsequently held many other marches in the East End. In the 1980s, rather pathetically, local nationalists spent a vast amount of time planning ways of destroying the mural, the signs of which are still in evidence today. Yes, it was a pathetic obsession, as while this energy was being channelled in a negative fashion, the East End was being taken over behind our very backs, street by street. This was typical of the inward looking and self indulgent behaviour that those days used to characterise nationalist activity. Now the mural is an anachronism. The communities, the people involved in that dispute of 70 years ago, are no more. To the local Bangladeshi population, this mural represents nothing more than a squabble between different groups of white people. The East End suffered more than any other part of the country from German air attack in the last war, not only during the Blitz but also from flying bombs. The first V2 that landed in England fell here in Grove Road in Bow in 1944. As I said, the East End was hit hard during the Second World War the worst ever civilian disaster took place at Bethnal Green Tube Station. It happened on the 3rd of March 1943 and 173 people died. The 3rd of the 3rd, 43 and 173 people. The number 3 seems to have had a malevolent significance. What happened was this. In Victoria Park, about half a mile away, an anti-aircraft battery test-fired some new rockets. This coincided with an air raid warning. Hundreds of people were already making their way to the underground station, which was used as an air raid shelter. When the unfamiliar sound of the rockets swooshing off overhead was heard, there was a panic that the bombs were already falling. There was a crush of people on these stairs. The barriers weren't there then, and there was no light due to the blackout. Or rather, the light had been smashed by people sensitive to the needs of the blackout. Bodies fell on bodies. Young children and babies in their mother's arms had their life crushed from out of them.